G'day. I apologise for being off the air for a long time, but with Christmas near, I now plan to do a few talks, and this is about the unmentioned Christmas story. In the Bible, we read who can endure the day of his coming. Malachi talks of a refiner's fire and fuller's soap. That's far away from away in a manger, but it's a failing to read only the comforting bits of the Bible and to reject what should actually raise our fears. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, but for some who think they're in the light, a great darkness continues to overspread them, and when darkness descends and we still must move, only fools fail to fear. Amos declares, Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? That day will be darkness, not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion only to meet a bear, as though he entered his house and rested his hand on the wall only to have a snake bite him. Will not the day of the Lord be darkness, not light, pitch dark without a ray of brightness? God continues a few verses down, Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. But let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never-failing stream. Is this the day of the Lord that we long for? A day of darkness, of unexpected danger? Malachi describes the coming of the Lord in chapter 3, where he says, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple the messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness and the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord as in days gone by, as in former years. Do we really understand what a full refiner's fire is or fuller's soap? A refiner takes the metal extracted from the ore and purifies it. So, for example, ore is roasted until gold melts out. That gold is still impure with chips of rock, carbon from the fire, sand. The refiner remelts that unrefined metal in a crucible. As it melts, the lighter impurities float to the surface. The refiner scoops them off onto the slag heap. There's no individuality. Everything scooped off is rubbish. Carbon rubbish, silicon rubbish. To the refiner, there is pure metal, pure copper, pure gold, pure lead, and there is slag. Extracting pure metal and discarding slag is hot, tiring, dirty work. What of the fuller, and didn't simply wash clothes like doing a shirt in the bathroom basin and hanging it to dry? It's even harder than doing full washing loads by hand. The fuller cleaned grease and dirt from new cloth, rubbed white clay through to take up grease, trampled the cloth in vats of urine with smooth stones in the bottom, then it was rinse and repeat with soap. After that, they stretched it out to dry. And don't imagine ordinary body soap, a full and needed tough, calloused feet to avoid burns from the caustic soap. Malachi is talking about burning, about soaking, about boiling, about harsh industrial washers. The day of the Lord is a day of scouring and melting, a day of purging and perfecting. Paul wasn't playing with words when he chided the Corinthians. He said, by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. 
If it's burned up, the builder will suffer loss, yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. This is the day of the Lord. Late one evening when I was a teenager, I was thinking on my way home about the return of Jesus and remembering what was preached at church. We heard that before there was any hardship, we Christians would be snatched away from earth. Then, in the same breath, as we were assured of being rescued, we were also terrified with tales of Armageddon and with all the nations gathered in the Valley of Jezreel had made little sense. We heard of birds picking the bones of the slaughtered thousands from all the nations. We anticipated not being able to buy and sell without the mark of the beast. I heard it all. Yet somehow, before those days came, we would be rescued from facing them. What should I make of it? Was this really what the Bible taught? I saw loose threads and I couldn't help pulling them. Then as I walked down the platform of my station, I saw a very different picture of Judgment Day. I had seen movies and heard the tales of what war was like. I imagined clouds lit garish red with the flashes of explosions, the stench of cordite, the burning taste of gas. I grasped the terror and chaos of the time of Jesus' coming, when nations rage furiously together, when people submit to empty imaginings, when kings rise up and rulers conspire against the Lord. That's the day when the clouds break golden through the chaos, when the Lord descends with a shout and the archangel's trumpet blast, the day when we who are alive rush to meet him as he dashes his enemies to pieces and rules adversaries with an unbreakable rod, not rescue, but victory. That is the day when he purifies his priests and workers in his kingdom, for judgment begins in the house of the Lord. I understood it. I grasped it, and I asked, why don't we believers get it? Why do we think that the day will be a day of light, a day of bright rays? Are we at ease in Zion? Are we overconfident in our situation? I found this quotation from the famous pastor and theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer in a commentary on our Malachi passage. He said, it's very remarkable that we face the thought that God is coming so calmly whereas previously peoples trembled at the day of the Lord. We have become so accustomed to the idea of divine love and of God's coming at Christmas that we no longer feel the shiver of fear that God's coming should arouse in us. We are indifferent to the message, taking only the pleasant and agreeable out of it and forgetting the serious aspect that the God of the world draws near to the people of our little earth and lays claim to us. The coming of God is truly not only glad tidings, but first of all, frightening news for everyone who has a conscience. Why did people previously tremble? Why do we not tremble today? Juan Carlos Ortiz illustrated the problem. He asked, without opening your Bible, tell me, what does Luke 12 verse 32 say? People all around the room start enthusiastically quoting it. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Then he says, still without opening your Bible, what's the next verse? Silence. Open your Bible and check, he says. Verse 33 says, sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide yourselves with purses that will not wear out, an inexhaustible treasure in heaven, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. Ortiz says, raise your hand if you have verse 32 underlined or highlighted. The hands go up. And then he says, keep your hand up if you have verse 33 underlined or highlighted. The hands go down. Isn't that true? Maybe it isn't so common for us to memorise scripture. Maybe that's a habit to get into again we would be more ready for revival if we had more of the word in us. Ortiz says that too many Christians have five Gospels. There is St. Matthew, St. Mark, St. Luke, St. John and St. Evangelicals, which is made up of all the comfortable underlined verses 
from the other Gospels. As Bonhoeffer said, we are indifferent to the message, taking only the pleasant and agreeable out of it and forgetting the serious aspect that the God of the world draws near to the people of our little earth and lays claim to us. I'm not heavily into conventional Calvinism, I'm more aligned with John Wesley, but I have a lot of sympathy with evangelical Calvinists like C.H. Spurgeon, who used to cheekily pray, Lord, save the elect, and then elect some more. I'm not even really into finding fault with those who preach that God's grace is irresistible and that once it has touched you, you could never lose it. But there is a kind of popular Calvinism which I definitely do criticise. It says, shake a preacher's hand, declare yourself a believer, and remember that God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Am I really secure for all eternity on the basis of a handshake? I believe that if a person can possibly lose his or her salvation, and I don't categorically say it's true possible, then it is only through a deliberate, determined decision to walk away from the Saviour and have no more to do with him. The Salvation Army lassie who told me she'd had a hard morning and had lost her salvation but had it back by 11am was talking nonsense. What I'm saying is that in the normal course of events, our salvation is secure in Christ. But, and this but is important, your salvation, my salvation, is only secure in Christ if we have it in the first place. That is, if you're not truly in a right relationship with Jesus, if you have never started on the right footing with him, then of course you have no salvation for him to secure. It's that simple. Shaking a preacher's hand doesn't guarantee salvation. I shake my mechanic's hand when my car is serviced, but that doesn't make me a mechanic. I have shaken hands with Sir John Kerr's daughter, with department heads, and with Tom Uran, a minister in the Whitlam government, but none of that changed me. You can recite a few words, John 3.16, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, or whatever, but that doesn't mean the great transaction is done, and I am Christ's, and he is mine forever. As Amos said, Away with the noise of your songs, I will not listen to the music of your harps, but let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never-failing stream. And so John also preached during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas when the word of God came to him. We read in Luke, He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough way is made smooth and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Think of the social revolution John proclaimed. And it was a social revolution in which God's people must participate. As the Jews anxiously waited for the Messiah to appear, John in the desert proclaimed a levelling. It's not about engineering works cutting through hilltops and in filling valleys. His is the same message of Mary's song. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent empty away. The mighty are brought low, the poor and the oppressed are exalted, the proud are deposed, and the humble lifted up. John preached about doing these things. He proclaimed the coming of God's kingdom. He said that participation in the life and salvation of that kingdom is about repentance, and making everything new for the Messiah's coming. To the extent that we're not doing that in our own lives and wherever we can reach, to that extent we too need to repent and renew our submission to the God of all creation who draws near to the people of earth and lays claim to us. The early Quaker George Fox preached quake before the Lord, shake in terror as you stand before the judge of every heart. 
as we focus on the first coming of Jesus and prepare for his return. As Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, first of all, it is frightening news for everyone who has a conscience. Let's prepare our hearts to be purified so that the King of Glory may come in. Amen. Thank you once again for watching this video. I'll ask you to like and subscribe so that you'll be notified when further talks are available. God bless you.